Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to my channel. If you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby and welcome. Today we are back with another identified doe case and this one is one that I did not have planned to do on my channel because she was just recently identified. I woke up yesterday, I was scrolling down Facebook, I saw the news and I was like, I have to do a video on that. This is a Jane Doe case I've been following on and off for quite some time now. So when I saw the pictures of what she actually looked like, it's just it's so surreal and I'm excited to share how she was identified and some of her backstory. So with that being said, let's just get into it. On February 5th, 1975, three boys were hiking through the woods not far from Cleveland when they stumbled across a site they would probably never forget. They came across the skeletal remains of a young girl in the mud along the rocky river. These three boys did the right thing and they notified police almost immediately upon examining her skeleton. She was missing most of her skin obviously from decay, part of her jaw, and she had a small hole in her skull. On the autopsy report, the Cuyahoga County Coroner wrote that the hole came from a .25 caliber bullet. It was determined her death was a result of a homicide because of the bullet hole and there was no physical evidence left at the scene. There was not much known about this young girl other than she was Caucasian, she was said to be in her late teens, early 20s, and her death was not done by her own hands. For more than 40 years, she would be known as unknown white female bones, and she was laid to rest in Potter's Field at a Cleveland cemetery in an unmarked pauper's grave. She was a person though. She had friends, she had family, she had people who loved her and missed her, and she deserved her name back. And because of an amateur detective online, she finally got it back. A college student named Christina Skates was working on her genealogy online and came across the cemetery's index and a line that read unknown white female bones in 2014. Christina could not stop thinking about this young girl who didn't have a name. She was roughly the same age as her when she died. She was found 20 miles away from where she lived. She just felt connected to her and she wanted to know if she was forgotten or missed. Who was she? Christina said, it was in the back of my mind for a couple of months every day thinking this isn't right. This isn't how things should be. That's why I looked into it further than I originally did. For the next year, it was in the back of her head. She tried to do as much research as she could looking at articles online and newspaper articles of people who disappeared in the early 70s. She even called the Strongville Police Department and they couldn't give her much information that wasn't already online. She then decided to contact the rangers at Cleveland Metro Parks since the woman's body was found along the Rocky River, now known as the Mill Stream Run Reservation. She was able to to get her hands on an original case file, but this again didn't really help her much. There just wasn't much information about this case at all and who this young girl could have been. So she did what a lot of people do and she went to Web Sleuths. Web Sleuths is a website where people can post information and discuss tips about cases, but this again went nowhere. So she decided to go to Reddit, another website where people can do the same. This did wonders. She posted all her information on there from newspaper articles and articles online and people were extremely interested and wanted to help in any way that they could. In the summer of 2015, an artist named Carl Koppelman who cross-references unidentified people got in contact with her and did a digital illustration of what she may have looked like from five to six photos of her skeleton. I have talked about Carl in my videos before. He does amazing work. I will link his Facebook page down below if you're interested in these type of cases. He does just A plus digital illustrations and he's helped crack cases before. Carl made a few phone calls and they realized this young girl was not in NamUs, which is a database that helps connect unidentified remains with missing people. And after entering her into the system, it didn't take much time for there to be a huge development in the case. In December of 2016, a missing woman named Linda Pagano was entered into the system and this became a possible match. During that same month, the Akron County Police Department contacted CCMEO and discussed the possible match and dental records were sent over. Linda's family and Christina were notified about this possible match and after looking at the reconstruction photo of this Jane Doe, Linda's family was sure that it was her. That's wild. And for the first time in more than 40 years, Mike Pagano said he felt like he was looking at his sister. The mouth is practically identical. Yeah. That, it's her. They exhumed the body in October of 2017 to compare the DNA of this Jane Doe to Linda's family. Then Christina received a call. 
At that point, I was on my computer playing video games or scrolling through Reddit, which apparently is a pastime of mine. When I got a message from a family member of Linda's confirming it was definitely hers. I got choked up when I got the news. I guess it was known to be coming because of how many similarities between the dental characteristics, the illustrations, and circumstance, but having it in DNA proof is a whole other thing. I was perfectly fine just bringing the case interest back to the case. Unknown white female bones finally got her name back. She was 17 year old Linda Pagano. Linda mysteriously disappeared after leaving her stepfather's home in Akron on September 1st of 1974. Unfortunately, Linda's parents both passed away before they could find out what happened to their daughter, but Linda's brother Michael and sister Cheryl now have some bit of peace. On July 12th, 2018, there was a press conference held by the Cuyahoga County Police Department and the medical examiners revealed to the world that the remains found all those years ago belonged to Linda Pagano. I think that the, the first step here with this investigation is to, to positively identify the victim as Linda. So, uh, of course, I would be hopeful and I think that it's a possibility that, that we could identify a suspect. Michael said, I thought I was in a dream. I thought I would never see this. I thought this day would never come. I thought I would die wondering. I am amazed how this came to light like it did. Michael said that their mother was always kind of in denial of what could have happened to Linda. Of course, as a mother, that's completely understandable. You kind of just don't want to admit how horrible this world can be. He said that the summer that Linda disappeared, she was staying with their previous stepfather at his home so she could go to summer school. Apparently, one night she came home late from a Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young concert her and this previous stepfather got into this huge argument, he kicked her out, and then she just mysteriously vanished, and they thought that they were going to die wondering what happened to her. I say previous stepfather because at the time of Linda's disappearance, her mother and this man were not together anymore. This man's name was Byron Claflin, and he was a prime suspect at the beginning of her disappearance. He was a bar owner and had a very bad temper according to people who knew him, but he is currently unable to be questioned because he passed away in 1990 and was never charged because there was no body or evidence. Michael always thought that Byron was the one responsible for his sister's disappearance. His mother and Byron ended up separating before Linda's disappearance because Byron was very abusive, mostly to Michael. He would beat him on the regular. At this time, their sister Cheryl was moved out of the home and their mother got a new boyfriend and their mother and Michael decided to move in with this man. Linda was not too fond of the new boyfriend, so she stayed living with Byron until her disappearance. You may be wondering why she decided to live with Byron, her previous stepfather, and not at this new man's house. Apparently, Byron was very abusive, but according to Michael and Cheryl, he wasn't abusive to Linda. They said that he treated her really well, actually. He never abused her and he would buy her things like clothes and a new car. So they didn't think that it was necessarily unsafe for her to stay with him. But of course, they didn't really have a choice because she was 17 and this was what she decided to do. A missing persons report was filed, but this didn't really go anywhere. But the strangest thing of all, in my opinion, is that her brand new Mustang was still at Byron's home after her disappearance. If you are 17 years old and you are kicked out of your home, why would you not get in your car and drive off? Why would she go outside and decide to just walk somewhere? There were no cell phones back then for her to just call somebody to pick her up. This just doesn't make sense and it's super fishy to me. Linda was said to be a kind-hearted person, loved animals, shy but very adventurous, and always was pumping music out of her radio. Her best friend, Suzanne Sigmund, said that the summer of 1974, Linda had a nice Mustang, a new boy she was seeing. She was on top of the world. Then she just vanished without a trace. Of course, this is extremely bittersweet because she finally has her name back, but the person responsible for her death is most likely deceased. And after my research, I can definitely agree with the family that I think Byron was responsible. I do have to give it to people like Christina who put in their time and effort without even getting paid for it just because they genuinely care and want to see some sort of resolution for these cases. I do agree with Christina in everything that she says. She urges people to please, if you have a loved one who has vanished, even if you think they are a runaway, please put them into some sort of a database like NamUs so they can possibly be linked up with a John or Jane Doe. Of course, it is absolutely horrible to think that something like that can happen to one of your loved ones, but it's just, it's 
it's better in the end to get some sort of closure. It does genuinely warm my heart that so many John and Jane Doe's are being identified recently. This is the third video that I have done on a John or Jane Doe that has been identified just this year in 2018. With social media and getting the word out there and websites like NamUs and the Doe Network, so many things are being done every single day to try to give these people back their identity and it's not just for them, it's for their family. You have to think about how it must be as a family waiting sometimes 50 years to find out what happened to a loved one. I have gotten comments from people before in the past telling me that there's no point doing my videos and that it's not going to help and it's not going to do anything and I just laugh because Yes, it does. Even if it's not me, it's somebody else that may come across my video and do research on their own and piece together everything. You never know what can happen. So thank you guys for taking the time out of your day to watch my video. If you have any other case recommendations for me to cover on my channel, definitely let me know down below in the comments. I read every single comment. And if you like that video and you're not already, make sure to hit that subscribe button and click that like button while you're at it if you like the video. I love you guys so much and we'll see you guys in my next video. Bye guys. And of course, as usual, duh, I love all my patrons. You guys are just the most amazing group of people. So supportive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.